So I better start off by saying my wife's in the audience. I am happily married, uh, <laughs> but we still have the romance. Um, <laughs> so I'm a, I'm, a, uh, I'm a Philly boy. Oops. Uh, I grew up in Philly. I um, graduated from Philly Public High School. I attended Drexel University and uh, graduated in engineering in 93 from Drexel. And uh, <clears throat> my senior year of college, I, I actually had a religious experience. I know this isn't Sunday morning, so I'll spare you guys the details. But um, uh, it's important to this story because for the first time after that experience, I really felt freed up to think about what my dreams and my passions were. And it didn't take me long to realize it wasn't engineering. Um, I, I, figured out that I really was passionate about urban education. And in 1996, uh, my dream came true. I started teaching math and science at West Philadelphia High School, uh, the very neighborhood I grew up in. And uh, I was so excited to be there. Um, you know, most of you know that West Philly is one of the more challenging schools in the city. And uh, as a young idealistic teacher, I just, I was excited to be in my neighborhood school. And I knew, I just knew that I was gonna change that place. Um, Needless to say, my first year was, was very humbling. Um, <laughs> didn't take any of my passion away, but, but helped me get a, a perspective. A couple other things were happening my first year uh, in high school. I started to think about uh, why did it take something as radical as a religious experience to get me to slow down and think about what my passions and interests were? Shouldn't have school done that? Shouldn't have it helped me kind of figure that out all 13 years uh, leading up to getting ready for college? And... I don't know what your school experience was like your senior year, but we dreaded going to see the, the counselor the senior year. It was kind of like waterboarding, you know? You run in, he lays you on the table, starts pouring water on you. What do you want to be? I don't know. Tell me. What should I be? You're good at math and science, be an engineer. I'll go to school for engineering. And you run out, and uh, five years later, you're like, what the hell am I doing? Um, so uh, the other big disconnect that was going on my first year is I thought everybody had to go to college. Um, and I, I was working in the auto shop uh, as the math science teacher, and two of the most brilliant men I've ever worked with were shop teachers. In the shop, they could solve amazingly complex problems, and if we'd go sit in the classroom to try to start to dissect something, they would start to go crazy. And it was a firsthand experience of this idea of multiple intelligence. Um, and I started to realize we, we're all smart in lots of different ways. Intelligence is not one size fits all. And yet, for the most part, schools are one size fits all. And so if you fit in, that's great. But if you don't, then what are you supposed to do? So in that context, uh, between the waterboarding and the multiple intelligence, I, uh, I decided to create this after school program. A lot is just as much for my own sanity um, as try to create good space for kids. And so we started off small. I had no idea what we were getting ourselves into. <clears throat> we started off with an electric powered go-kart. The kids built it, designed it, and built it for the science fair. West Philly kids got second place in the science fair. The first time uh, West Philly did anything, uh, won anything in the science fair. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, they wanted to do something bigger, of course, the following year, and they, we had a Jeep, not the ideal car for electric, but they, they did an amazing project, and they actually won the Philadelphia science fair uh, and went on to the states. Um, and by the third year, I was looking for a national competition to showcase their work in, and we found something called the Tour de Soul which was an alternative vehicle uh, competition from New York City to Washington, D.C., and we we're the first team of color to enter that competition, and that very first year, we had a wonderful time. It was an incredible learning experience for us all. Uh, took the car back to the shop, worked on it, painted it orange, um, refined it to get over 180 miles per gallon, and went back to the 2002 Tour de Soul and beat out 40 other teams, including MIT, that year to win that competition. <laughs> that, that's kind of how we felt, too. We were like, we can do anything, you know? Um, as, as a teacher, you tell your kids that, but we all know there's limitations. But we actually started to believe we could do anything, which is a wonderful feeling. Um, and something else interesting happened. The students got a firsthand experience with Toyota and uh, Honda's uh, hybrid vehicles that year, they were using the tortoise soul as a test market, and my kids don't fit that demographic, but they, they realized that hybrids were the future. And to, to accelerate their acceptance, they thought something was missing. So I challenged them to think about that. Let's make that our next project. Figure out what's missing with hybrids. And so they did. 
Um, they said, why can't we make hybrids fast and fuel efficient? Why can't they be cool and earth friendly? And so, uh, so they came up with the idea of a badass hybrid. And so we built the <laughs> badass hybrid. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, we won the 2005 Tour de Sol with that, that vehicle. Uh, it's kind of our tradition to paint it. So we painted it the following year and won again. Um, and, uh, and that put us in position in 2007. The XPRIZE Foundation announced an international competition for vehicles that uh, could get over 100 miles per gallon. It was a $10 million competition. And 111 teams from around the world were accepted into the competition. We were the only high school uh, that was permitted to, to enter the competition. Uh, and we developed two vehicles for that competition. They had to be uh, feasible vehicles. So we wanted something that was safe and affordable. And we wanted to showcase American technology. The kids, the, the auto, uh, American automotive industry was collapsing. The kids said, you know what? We can use American technology, make a car for $25,000 and get it to get over 100 miles per gallon. Um, Unfortunately, we only got 80 miles per gallon mixed on that vehicle, uh, so it was good enough to get us to the semifinals. We beat out 90 other teams. Um, we were in the final 22, and we built another hybrid sports car. Um, we beat MIT again. Uh, we beat Cornell. Um, and multiple uh, multi-million dollar startup companies. It was an incredible learning experience. And so, <clears throat> So what can we take away from this? Um, how many of you saw Chris's speech earlier today? Good, I'm done then. I'll see you guys later. <laughs> uh, so, so a lot of progressive educators end up at the same place. Um, you may have heard urban education in this country is in crisis. 50% of the kids in any given district are not graduating. Of the 50% that do, only 15% are going on plus or minus a few percent uh, to a post-secondary uh, success. And that's not sustainable. It's not sustainable for our country, for our city. It's definitely not sustainable for teachers who are on the front lines. And it's not sustainable for our children. And, um, and so what's the district's solution been? More of the same. Standardized testing. Uh, we've got to get into basics. And they haven't changed the approach. In the 15 years I've been working in the Philadelphia School District, I've survived four different reforms. They're all basically the same. They changed the terminology. But the fundamental approach is the same. And then you see schools like Chris's school and programs like my program that have taken a radically different approach. And you can see the type of results you can get when you start with what are kids' interests and passions um, and give them something real to do. So I want to pause here. Although <clears throat> I think that uh, um, most of you are probably convinced there's better ways to do education, for folks that are watching that think that people that start with project-based learning aren't for um, basic skills. I want to just pause for one second. The math teacher is going to come out and I'm going to give you guys a high stakes test. Chris let you off easy. I'm not going to. <laughs> so you all graduated high school. You're here. You're successful. You're hanging out at 10 conference today. Um, and so if you passed, uh, if you graduated high school, you had to pass Algebra 2. And if you passed Algebra 2, you definitely did the quadratic formula, one of the most important pieces of information. And if that information is required for your success, then logically we can say that you all know this. So you guys ready? Take out your pens, papers. No pens and papers? Detention, man. Detention. <laughs> all right. Here we go. How many of you can, the ticker is going quick here. How, how, we don't have time to do it. But how many could solve this if I gave you the time? Not the, the engineering professor from Temple raised his hand. All right. Um, any, like, super brainiacs? You got me the answer? No? All right. There's the answer, six and two, six and negative two, I'm sorry. What does it mean? Who cares? <laughs> it, it actually has a real world application, but mathematics actually does always have a real world application. It's just never taught that way. Um, of the folks that raised your hand, if you were to graph that, how many could tell me what that would represent on the graph? All right. It is a parabola, but what are the points on, what do those two numbers represent on the graph? The engineering professor, help us out. Yes, they, where, it's where they cross the x-axis. And, and in real life, that actually means something really exciting. I get excited, but I can see that you don't. Um, <laughs> but, so the point is, is that, what is the point? The point is, is that you all got here without knowing one of the most important concepts, many of you, without knowing one of the most important concepts from high school. 
And if you look at the volumes of stuff we're trying to get kids to learn, uh, it's, there's just so much wasted time, and it turns so many children off to school. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was given a presentation with one of my students, and he said something that just blew me away. And I think this is part of the essence of what I'm trying to get to. Um, Azim is a senior on the team, and in his talk, he said, you can't teach critical thinking without critical conditions. And he went on to say, if I fail a test, who cares? I got a bad grade. He said, but if I'm doing something real, like building a car, and I make a mistake, then the car doesn't work. We might lose the race. <laughs> and, then, and then he went on to say, a wheel might fall off and my teacher could die. Uh, <laughs> I was like, wait, wait a second. That, that wouldn't be good. Um, so, so what am I suggesting? I'm suggesting much of the same thing that Chris was talking about. You know, and, and the big question is, why don't schools do this? Uh, it can be messy, but it's really not that difficult. I, we've got thousands of pictures up on our Flickr site. I just grabbed a few quickly. This is Seiku actually working on the car. Um, uh, so project-based learning can look at like all sorts of things. Uh, this summer, we had students doing research on green roofs, and they actually built a green roof and collected data on what the effects of that would be. Uh, Tyson is having fun in the shop. Uh, Stefan is giving a speech with the mayor at City Hall. There's all sorts of things that come out of a single project. And there's so many different places where kids can get engaged. And so what I would like to challenge us all to think about is, is how we can use our voices to um, push back on education, to allow kids to be creative, and give them space to solve real problems. I have one additional thought. Um, before I get there, I would like to uh, show a short video. For, while this may be a difficult time for our nation, and we face some tough challenges, it's that potential that ought to give us hope. We need no better example than the students who are here today from West Philadelphia High School. Uh, these students, under the direction of some terrific teachers, entered a global competition against serious corporate and college challengers to build a production-ready car that runs on very little fuel. So as part of an after-school program, they worked to get their vehicles ready. They tweaked the hybrid engine. They figured out how to make their cars run more efficiently. At first, the adults didn't really think their team had a chance. Admit it. <laughs> but then something strange happened. Where older and more seasoned teams failed, they succeeded, even making it through an elimination round. Now, they didn't win the competition. You know, they're kids. Come on. But they did build a car that got more than 65 miles per gallon. They went toe-to-toe -to -toe with car companies and big-name universities. <laughs> went against big-name universities, well-funded rivals. They held their own. They didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have the best equipment. They certainly didn't have every advantage in life. What they had was a program that challenged them to solve problems and to work together to learn and build and create. And that's the kind of spirit and ingenuity that we have to foster. That's the potential that we can harness all across America. That's what will help our young people to fulfill their promise, to realize their dreams, and to help this nation succeed in the years to come. Uh, and I, I, I just have to editorialize. This, uh, is the kind of thing that just isn't going to get a lot of attention initially. This will not lead the nightly news. You won't see this on uh, the cover of Roll Call or Politico. Uh, it's not, doesn't have conflict and uh, uh, controversy behind it. But, but these are actually the kinds of things that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we're going to look back and say this is something that made a difference. So you guys can fill in the blank. I can't remember exactly what I said, but it was good. That's, that's what I remember. <laughs> so, um, uh, oh yeah, I almost forgot. Uh, Chris said hi to his wife. Hi, hon. <laughs> I didn't want to sleep on the couch tonight. Um, and my dad's here too, hey, Pop. <laughs> um, so thank you guys for coming. Um, so I want to leave with one last thought. 
my dream is, has been fulfilled in many ways I didn't expect. Um, and I've learned things that I didn't expect to learn. Uh, and my dream is still to be active in urban education. But now my dream is to start a school. Um, we need more schools like the one that Chris runs. We need more schools to give more students opportunities to learn. What we've done in just an after school program needs to be a school day program. And so uh, you can find out more information on our website about, uh, about what we're trying to do. Uh, I love help in any, any form, suggestions, um, and any type of support. So thank you very much.